You know how to book flights and hotels. All you're missing is a tool to plan the travel experiences you'll have once you arrive. That's why you need Viator. Book guided tours, excursions, and more in one place. There are over 300,000 travel experiences to choose from, so you can find something for everyone. And Viator offers free cancellation and 24-7 customer support for worry-free travel. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. Find travel experiences for you. Do more with Viator. Welcome to Comedy Album Book Club. This past spring, my wife Heather and I traveled to the United Kingdom for a road trip from London to Glasgow. During our visit, we had the opportunity to sit with Rosie and Nicola Dempsey, also known as Flo and Joan. Rosie and Nicola were born and raised in Britain, but visited North America to study improv and sketch comedy before settling for a time in Toronto. When not traveling, Exploring the Dufferin Mall or working as a butcher, they were studying at I.O. in Chicago, as well as Second City and Bad Dog Theatre Company in Toronto. Nicola worked as a musical director in Toronto's Second City Training Centre, and Rosie as a member of Second City's House Company. The duo had a viral hit with their song 2016, which racked up over 47 million views on YouTube and was featured on Funny or Die, Comedy Central, and The A.V. Club. They have since returned to London, from which they stage frequent tours. They are in fact on tour right now with shows at the Players Theatre in Thame, tomorrow, November 15th, and upcoming shows at the Players Theatre, Norwich Playhouse, the Lowry in Salford, and the Stables in Milton Keynes, all coming up in November. Not content only to tour, they have also recorded performances for Horrible Histories, This Hour Has 22 Minutes, and a special for Amazon, Flo and Joan, Alive on Stage, available for purchase or streaming on Amazon right now. I ask you forgive the sound. We recorded this over an outdoor brunch at a London cafe where children were playing, and in true British weather fashion, it was interrupted by rain. Additionally, due to the gremlins in the machines over the Atlantic, I'm sorry to say we lost a few minutes. That said, This is still a great conversation, touching on the challenges of performing in Canada versus the United States or the United Kingdom, talent traveling across the Atlantic, and musical and comedy influences. Thanks once again to Nicola and Rosie for taking the time to sit with us, and please enjoy this interview with Nicola and Rosie Dempsey, also known as Lo and Joan. something that still holds the up and still makes you laugh yeah. like after that long yeah they're really um, they're so they really hold up I mean some stuff you're like but, um, but I think for the, the people that they use I think were sort of they were kind of, they were mainstream people they weren't sort of putting on alternative I guess no, maybe they were doing I think all, the alternative comics were sort of doing something else um, but yeah they were sort of mainstream kind of people yeah what were the name? what's the name of the Victoria one Victoria Wood one where she does the um Fitness lady. Oh, I think it's called. I think it's just called Victoria Wood Live. I've got it on my phone. I can't remember the name of it. Yeah. Um, they're like filmed ones. Comedy albums. I just downloaded the Steph Tolev one. Yeah. And you've you've listened to it, I've haven't to you? It, yeah. I've and got her it. First one as well. I haven't listened to her first one. I don't think. I saw it's it good. live. Um, do you know? I don't think comedy albums are a bigger thing in the no. UK as they are in America either. Yeah. Yeah, we so much too. It's more like a TV special that will go yeah. and then you'll watch it. It's so yeah. if you have a favorite TV, TV special. It's probably been recorded live anyway. Um, I think definitely the Victoria Wood ones. Um, I'm gonna go home and be like, oh, it's that one. Um, <laughs> you watched the Billy Connolly the other day. I watched Billy Connolly's one. That was amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jeez. Kids are dying. It was trying to center out here. Down. There was literally no one here. Um, <laughs> it's just us. Such you a shame. You crowd. I do. I guess I'm wearing Gap kids, so I guess I just smell it. Um, oh, what was I watching? Uh, Billy Connolly. That was amazing. Um, I just had one in my head. And I, oh, the first, the first DVD box set I ever bought of like 
five specials was Eddie Izzard and I oh, just yeah. sat I think I was like 14 or 15 and a friend of mine really liked them but his la- his use of language is so meticulous and yeah. per- it's just beautiful to watch yeah, yeah. it's the first weird comedy I think I'd ever watched where I was I felt a bit stupid but not in like a stupid way in a way of like oh I need to like really nut up on the world yeah and he was just it was just brilliant it was definitely like my first comedian who wasn't on television yeah and just a bit of a weirdo where I was like oh I like what you do I really was really drawn to him cool. I still have I still watch them so um, uh, you both sing and I've seen you both play recorders and yes. you play the piano yeah. uh, what can you, what's your musical background so we both had <laughs> that's how I've read about it now <laughs> Um, we, our mum put us both in sort of piano lessons and stuff when we were younger. Mm-hmm. I think for like things to do after school. Um, and because she, our mum plays the piano and is a musician, um, not professionally, just sort of for the lols. And uh, so we both sort of had piano lessons and went through various different. I start with piano, you quit. Yeah, um, I did grade one. <coughs> Smashed it. Yeah, <laughs> did very well. Didn't have to go past you that. Would <laughs> I've done piano. <laughs> Next, teach at six. Yeah, um, and then we both sort of cycle, cycle through a couple of other things. So like, I played the cello. <laughs> Our mum was like, when we got to secondary school, she was like, you can choose one big instrument that you can, that can be your thing. And I was always desperate to play the trumpet, and you had the cello. So it was, you had your one, your one big thing. Um, and we, we sort of did it for a few years. I can, I lost a bit of faith. I just wasn't that fantastic at it. And I think you didn't want to try. When you're like 14, there are so many other things in the world that you're like, well, I'm not good at it, I don't want to do it. Yeah. As opposed to, I'm not good at it, I want to get better. I wish I'd stuck with it. Oh, we tried to get wish. it into shows and it's just not. We've tried to put the trumpet into shows. But <laughs> yeah. We've tried it twice and it's just not working. Right. <laughs> I'd um, love to. No, you, you um, sort of touched on the um, British history of comedy and there seem like from an outsider, it seems like there's more of a tradition of musical comedy here with like pantomimes and Gilbert and Sullivan yeah. and all of that. Uh, is that a fair assumption, do you think? I think so. Yeah. I think it's, we have such a great thing here. There's, we're touring at the moment and there's a theatre in every single town because they've been here since like the 1900s because I think the Music Hall and Variety Theatre yeah. was such a huge thing here and it's just carried on. So variety, um, like a variety of comedy is available to watch on television and live and things like that. And I think it definitely comes from the kind of musical and like Gilbert and Sullivan and that kind of stuff, yeah. that history. And thank God we've just like held on to it. And so people really do embrace all kinds of weird and wonderful stuff and like that makes it into the mainstream as well so everyone can see it. Yeah, I think it's where it started from, it didn't start, but from the wartime. Mm. Lots of this, the things that entertainment during the war was huge, and lots of wartime songs, and people going to entertain the troops and things yeah. like that. Which, it, and then after the war, people needed to cheer up, and you had all these theatres around that hadn't been bombed, so people would go and do shows in these music halls that were still there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it just, ca- yeah, there's definitely a, th- like a real theatrical. We've got so many theatres in the UK. Yeah. Um, not all of them are surviving, but mm-hmm. there's, there's uh, yeah, entertainment in the UK is huge, and yeah. TV entertainment. Yeah. Your Friday and Saturday nights were often like I, we used to stay in on Saturday nights to watch the lineup of TV from like <laughs> six yeah. till ten pm. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. Do you find how is the comedy world different here than it is in Toronto? If, I mean. Canada doesn't seem to value its comedians in a lot of ways, I find. Yeah. Um, is, is it? Is, I'm guessing it's a better audience here and it's more receptive to things like musical comedy. I think so. I think that um, they... I think the problem in Canada was, like, the expanse of it because it's so massive, so it's difficult for your comedians to tour and, like, we can get up to, like, Newcastle and back in a day to do a show, which you can't visit every end of your country in a small amount of time which means that then people don't get to see it as much as here and then I think that they it might also be like that it's cheap to do but we film a lot of comedy and put it on TV uh, because it doesn't cost very much money I I think I don't know I'm not an expert on that kind of stuff Um, and we don't have I don't they don't import as much American comedy as I think they do in Canada and I think that when you've got all of that stuff available to you 
it's it shouldn't be but it's people would rather go with a banker they don't want to take risks when they don't have very much money yeah. so they see that uh, the big bang theory does well in the state mm-hmm. so they're like oh we'll just put that on like, yeah. oh invest in your talent but then when yeah. you look at things like uh, like Baroness von Sketch Show and Kim's Convenience yes. and Shit's Creek and yeah. all those kind of things that are blow like you put them online you get them on Netflix and people are just inhaling them so you ho- I hope with my whole heart that people in Canada see that their stuff does well outside of it and choose to invest more time in it that this is this ideal world that we all live in where everything you want to happen happens that people <laughs> invest in their own talent instead of outsourcing it yeah, yeah. you guys want to go in yeah um, now you play a bunch of different genres in your your act there's a pop kind of music there's folk patter songs even like how when you're when you're constructing a bit how do you figure out okay this is going to work as sort of like a patter song kind of situation or this is going to work as a traditional english folk tune <laughs> you yeah. sort of know, it's often uh, what this song is about um for, like for example if the song is about coffee Mm-hmm. Coffee is about being keeping you awake. You know it's probably going to be a fast, quippy song, but if it's about feeling tired, you know it's going to be. Or, you, or, you, the, reverse. or the reverse, where it's not about being tired and it's going to be extremely fast. Um, often, what you're talking about dictates the um, dictates the song. With the folk song, we the tradition of folk is storytelling, and it's often quite slow, and it's often. You add a bit of information, or it's the story of someone going through something. So we, there's like a few games going on there. That it's you're adding extra bits, but the bits you're also adding are the same. Begin with the same letter. Um, I think so we'd at the with that song in particular. You had a piece of music and said, "I want to write a song in this style." Yeah, and I had a piece of song that was like about a harvest or something, and it was just a man on a guitar singing about the harvest is coming, and, and it was just this long, slow, weird song. Yeah about the harvest and I've been to a show and all I'd heard was the words the lady in the woods and was like oh this is I couldn't tell you what the scene was about it wasn't about a lady in the woods yeah. but they just said the words the lady in the woods and I was like okay I'm going to bank that and hold on to that <laughs> and it was just that was a marriage of like two and it wrote itself quite quickly I think Yeah. Um, but sometimes we'll start from genre as well of I want to write a song that sounds like this what would be a cool thing that fits with it um, and sometimes it doesn't work and you'll sort of play around with the genres instead so we'll sort of try something in a different style to see if that's uh, that's why the song was working uh, and it might just also be that the song was never funny and it doesn't matter what style of music you put to it it was never going to work yeah. well, and the lady in the woods uh, what I loved about that bit or that song was it just es- the escalation comedically is so natural and so but it, the payoff is so great <laughs> every time it just, it just is like oh, oh where, where's it going to go next yeah. and it just is like so intensely satisfying <laughs> every time you up the stakes in the song yeah. <laughs> like, my favourite thing is up. sorry my favourite thing is where the audience are like we know the game we know like at, there's one point we, we add a, I think it's where we add the word bilingual I think the audience are like okay we get it and then as soon as you say there's more it, <laughs> like for whatever reason yeah. that, 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 that didn't used to be in the song it used to just yeah. go all the way through but it was the, there's more bit that like gave it the extra bit yeah um, and also when we did it in we wrote it when we were in Toronto um, and it used to it was an eight minute song it was so much longer and in Toronto they just couldn't get enough like every single thing you added they just lost their mind and then we brought it back to the UK to preview it before we went to Fringe and after five minutes they lost they were into it and then at five minutes were like that's enough we understand <laughs> yeah, we so it's now it. the version that we do now is a lot shorter than the original because Toronto I don't know whether it's that they liked listening to the style or our accent or what it was yeah. but English the English people audiences lost I mean, after five minutes yeah. Right? No, yeah, like, we it. It. yeah we, we understand <laughs> Um, now, now, you've done Fringe. Uh, w- one of your albums, uh, Victory Flaps, was based on your Fringe show. Yeah. Um, so what's that experience like? Like, how is it how, how, how is it flyering? How is it interacting with other acts? What's, what's it like there? It's mad. You're, you're smashing your face into a wall. <laughs> uh, Victory Flaps was, that was the first time we went to, it, yeah, we'd, we'd just been, li- we'd been living in Toronto doing this. We'd just been writing songs in between working and just doing gigs in Toronto. 
there was no we we weren't writing to go to the Edinburgh Fringe, which now we are. Yeah. Our whole year is building up to Edinburgh Fringe. Edinburgh Fringe is finished. You reset. You write again for Edinburgh Fringe. Because Fringe is like a it's like a car show for comedians where you put everything you have on display and you hope that people come and see it and then they put you in a thing or they hire you to talk or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that was a fun show because everything we were writing was we were writing musical comedy for the first time. So everything was fun. Uh, and we you weren't writing with the pressure of having to put together. So when we went to we had an hour of music so when we went to Edinburgh Fringe, it was a free venue. So we didn't have to pay production fees or anything like that. So you, you literally go to turn up, hope that the audience might come in. You haven't uh, you haven't promised them anything because you, they're not paying for a ticket. You just sing your songs and hope that people enjoy it and hope that they bring more people back. We had a really great time and our audience has got bigger and bigger, which was such a good sign that yeah. you're doing something right. Because so that means people are telling other people to come. And because we'd never done any comedy in the UK ever, we started doing Flo and Joan in Toronto. So we had no... I mean, we didn't have a following in Toronto. People just knew us because we were around. But going to the UK, knowing no one, and just crossing your fingers that people will come on the promise that your poster doesn't look like it was made in Microsoft Paint. <laughs> and, like, and that you sort of said to someone, we're not, we promise we're not bad. Yeah. Um, and you just hope that someone comes. Yeah. And so when they do, and yeah, those audiences get bigger, it's a nice, like, okay, we're not... We're not delusional. We might not be terrible at this. Or at, least, at the very least, people will tolerate it for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> the flyering is horrible. Yes. Have you ever had to fly a show? Yes, uh, I've done Toronto Fringe, which doesn't oh, compare, no. but it's... Uh, it's it's, it's kind of right. that, like, times yeah. a thousand. But it's still the, the... It's the exact same feeling of having to sell a show that you're in and tell people... It's humiliating telling people that... Please like me. I yeah. think this is good. I and mean, then, come and make up your mind, but I think you should, you should maybe yeah. come. And then two, like, two yeah. metres down the road, you see your flyer that you've just handed someone like trampled yeah. into the rain like oh. yeah it was the first time we'd ever like really had to sell ourselves at all yeah there were some days where we just wouldn't fly and we'd be like I can't, I can't do this today it's raining yeah. there's no one here it is what it is yeah. and we know it's our fault yeah <laughs> now we're, we're this is our fourth one going in and it's completely different it's, I mean still the same emotional stress but a different experience than that we have a producer now so they we had we had one last year as well and they literally you just turn up and play the like they'll put everything there the, the keyboard up for you <laughs> and they fly it for you I mean you're paying a lot of money yeah. to have yeah. it it's, it's, not, not, yeah, it's, it's not out of the goodness of their heart yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we owe them a lot um, <laughs> but it's a, yeah it's, a, it's like the other side of the the first year that we did it you don't have to fire at all like the first year you, I, I bought a jacket that had big pockets so I could put all my leaflets in the pocket big bag you constantly got a backpack carrying all your leaflets around anyone you talk to you have to you feel like you have to give them a leaflet now you don't even have to mention that you're low and giant I mean that's on us as well I mean we should don't do that. That. Yeah. <laughs> but we need to do our bit as well yeah yeah but it's just a different a different way of doing the fringe have you thought of doing other like I know Australia they have a, a, a pretty great fringe presence there and and like there's the sort of fringe circuit have you thought of doing other other fringe shows we just did um, we're just well I say we're just back we're we were just in Melbourne for the comedy festival um that's where we saw Wolverine Vampires. That's where we saw Wolverine But that was similar to Edinburgh that we were brought out to do that. Um, but we had friends who, I think Melbourne lands in a way that Adelaide Fringe is just before the Melbourne Comedy Festival. So a lot of people will do Adelaide, then do Melbourne, and then they go and do the sort of Sydney um, festival. We've, not, we've never said no. To, like, we've never said we won't do it. I'd love to do, it. I'd love to do the Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney next yeah. year. <laughs> Yeah, you can Lots. say that Winnipeg Fringe is really it's good big. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have a couple we, of friends who do it, and they, they yeah. just love it. Yeah, yeah. lots of people go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Edmonton, is that a good one? Yeah, yeah is, Edmonton is a pretty big theater town. Yeah, uh, I, it's, I think it's one of those situations again where it's like you know there, there's nothing else to do. Yeah. So you go to the theater. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's like you, you can't like have all these distractions. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, it's pretty good. Like there's this one Australian act that we saw at Fringe event originally. Uh, by Rotten Punk, who are like they're hilarious. They're a parody of 
the white stripes. So it's the red dots. But they're dots. German white stripes. They're German, <laughs> but they're really, they're Australians who are pretending to be brother and sister. Is it Otto and Astrid? Yes. 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 We used to gigs with them in what? Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. Like they're on the drums. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They were hilarious. So like they're just been brilliant. I, I, I met them when I was renting gear for my friend's show uh, and they were just renting gear next to me and they were like, oh, you should come out. So like, and then I'm like, amazing. Well, it was amazing. Really yeah, we've seen them every time they've been in Toronto since. Yeah. So they're That's just so terrific. Good. Do they just do what they do with the fringes? Is that- yeah, yeah. Like I think now they're doing this stuff with a circus See? in Australia. They said that. They said something yes, to do with the yeah. collaboration. But yeah, so they were touring that. Uh, Toronto Fringe doesn't really work out for a lot of artists. They, it's not it's really on the show. Yeah, it feels a little bit clinical sometimes. Yeah. I've, everything I've seen there I've, I've loved, but you have to... Not so, everyone gets in, there's a lot of... Um, I mean, all fringes are kind of like that, but I mean, the Toronto one is just... It doesn't always... I, I don't For whatever reason, it's not as much of the fringe circuit yeah. As, yeah. as a lot of, like, Winnipeg yeah. is. I think it's the yeah. like film festival. I think the yeah. like, Toronto yeah. film festival sort of takes yeah. over that sort of yeah. festival yeah. mentality yeah. of the city. And, and it's, it's, it's like, like right by Pride as well, so there's so yeah. many other things going on that it's really, like, sucks yeah. the air out of it. Yeah. But you'd think it would, like, oh, this is... While you're here for this, come and see this. Yeah. But, it's yeah. funny because it's we've both done not as Flo and Joan but have been involved in sort of fringe shows it, were involved in fringe shows in Toronto in various capacities and it it feels like the general public don't go out to see things in the same way that they do at other fringe which is so annoying and so frustrating that it's amazing as an artist as an artist I hate that word but like to go and uh, to see other people's stuff um, but then it is just people doing stuff for other like artists doing stuff for other artists where you're like this is it's so good but so many more people should be seeing this than they are and that seems like Toronto in a nutshell though. yeah like the so audiences true. in Toronto like, at least for theatre is like theatre lovers but there's not a lot of general public yeah. outside of that yeah, yeah. Um, the comedy scene seems to be getting increasingly better though yeah, like, yeah. That, that's what like I think the comedy bar and like, love Bad it. Dog Theatre and yeah. stuff they seem to be creating a, more of a community of people they're like yeah. how many where every time I go there it's packed yeah you know, and they have there aren't that many co- like considering Toronto is a major city there aren't that many venues to go and see comedy no you've got the like, yuck like, yucks yeah. and yeah. comedy bar and I'm pity bad dog and absolute yeah. like five or six yeah. Yeah. That, you know I mean there's all, like open mic things but yeah. like establishments yeah, yeah. yeah. for comedy lovers I think a lot of people think of yuck yucks as a place to go for, like, for a date yeah. yeah but like I think uh, the true comedy yeah. people don't think of yuck yucks as a place no. to go like, Comedy bar and bad like performance. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a friend of ours was in a friend of ours. Probably everyone we know was in comedy bar one night for whatever reason. And like Eric McCormack from Will and Grace was there. Like yeah. they, it's just a cool venue where like cool people like all puff in. Not that he was there to do a set, <laughs> but uh, that cool people just come and do. They that's where you go to see real cool comedians. Yeah. Just like turn up and do a bit and then more time. Cool. <laughs> it's, uh, I've been. Have you ever? You've been to New York. Have you been to the Comedy Cellar? We didn't go to the Comedy no. Cellar. We went to one thing. We got tricked into going it. into a not very good place. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah. that's what that's a trailer. Oh, you know, so and so a plate beer now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I get a similar feeling from the Comedy Cellar as I do at the Comedy Bar, yeah. where it's a place that where it's like. It sounds a little wanky, but I, we've done this the NBC tour a bunch of times. Yeah. My earliest comedy experience was Saturday, like Saturday yeah. Night Live. And I lived on the West Coast. We'd get it over the air. Yeah. So it was at a time when in kindergarten I was watching Eddie Murphy yes. at a far too impressionable age. Yeah. Um, and so going there is sort of like going to the Vatican for me. It's like this is like yes. this, this church. Yeah. But then when you know go to a place like a comedy bar or the comedy cellar, it's more like a it's like a home shrine kind yeah. of thing. It's just yeah. this pure love yeah. Yeah. of comedy. So whereas like NBC is like this is formality, but that's like the gritty people trying out new stuff yeah. and just just making it or flopping hard and yeah. embracing yeah. the moment. Yeah. And that's I find that so much more powerful as yeah. comedy. Yeah, that's the thing that I think helped us so much in Toronto. I'm not putting us on the same level of huge like huge comics you go into try stuff out but there was no risk so we could just bum around on a stage for 15 minutes try new things there was no pressure but everyone was so supportive and just enjoys watching people work stuff out like you get to a point where you have tested their patience where they're like are you going to say anything funny and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry um, but it is like it's a place where kind of nerds and enthusiasts go and enjoy watching people just figure their stuff out and then also absolutely destroying a crowd yeah. and then there's such a nice 
There's, it sounds patronising now that I don't know that, but there's such a nice a pride of watching people succeed there. People are so proud of everyone doing well. There's never, as far as I'm aware, I might be wrong, but like there's, everyone is so excited to watch people move to LA and do a spot on Kona yeah. or like yeah. move to New York and start writing. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, so nice. The Junos this year, right? Like, yeah. I'm, uh, they, we had like Dave Marheji who moved to, uh, moved to the States. Um, oh. What's her name? Deborah Giovanni yeah. also moved to the States. So those are two big comedians, but like the love between all of those yeah. like nominees, and we got to talk to all of them, and like there's just it's just such positivity in yeah. the Toronto comedy community, and it's like this is kind of nice. Yeah. You know? <laughs> So, I just think I wonder if it's because there's not as much opportunity. So it's, I feel like here it's maybe a little bit more. It's competitive. A little bit more competitive, not in an aggressive way, but in a, there's more opportunity to get to do radio and TV. So you want to, but you're going for those things that you just can see happening. I wonder if I don't know, but I wonder if in Toronto the opportunities are less. So it takes a bit of the edge off of having to gun for anything you can get people were just a bit more like working stuff out and just doing it because they love doing it yeah. I, I don't know I, I, I don't know because neither of us have been in that position of yeah being on that being on that Level. side of it we only d- were doing it for a couple of years and just essentially pissing around um, but uh, yeah I wonder if that if it's different in that way yeah yeah Oh, so in Toronto, if somebody, you hear a comedian, oh, they went to L.A., to us that means like, oh my God, they made it big, they're in L.A. Yeah. So yeah. Um, being based out of the U.K., what would that point be for you, that location where you're like, well, they made it, they are in this place. What would that be for you? Would that be considered outside the U.K., America? I think people, they would think it was cool if you made it in, if you went to New York and did mm-hmm. it all like I think if you make it in the U.K. But this is it. I think it's less, oh, you've gone there and you've done this thing. It's, yeah. oh, they just got live at the Apollo. Or they've just done. <laughs> live at the Apollo. Is the, big thing, is the big yeah. one, or they've just got a sitcom, like they've yeah. just got a sitcom, or they've just started. Uh, I think Live at the Apollo is probably the big one. Yeah, or just like any kind, yeah, Live at the Apollo, any kind of special, Comedy Central specials. Yeah. Now that um, a couple of, when they did, Netflix did the Comedians of the World, yeah. that was a big deal, and um, a, uh, when they did the, the comedy, I can't remember what they were called, but they were like little 15 minute small. Um, oh, yeah. I think, were they just called the stand ups or something like that? Yeah, the stand ups. Um, yeah. The tail uh, lane and, and yes, all of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a guy um, who we saw. Sort of gig with a bit Phil Wang he was one of the first UK comedians I think to get any kind of Netflix um, that might be wrong so don't write me on well don't write me on it we're recording it um, but he it was oh he's doing stuff for Netflix that which I think is like a goal for everyone but yeah. in the UK because we it's less um, it's less where you've physically gone and more of what have you what have you done right. um, and live I think live at the Apollo and things like that and uh, the big one that people are going for. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, I wonder if it's... I, if people go to America and you see someone smashing it in America, I don't know if you. I don't know if you view it and be like, oh, they're like. I, I think because the UK is such a comedy haven, yeah. and lots of British comics are very British. So if you can smash your home audience, then yeah, yeah. then you're set. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it feels yeah. almost too like like coming to Britain for a Canadian comedian would be like going to New York or LA to yeah. a certain degree yeah. as well. Like, yeah. like, I can't remember her name. She did a live in the. Apollo. Catherine Ryan? Yes. Yeah. Huge. So she's, huge. She's, yeah, huge. She's like, like Canada, I'm like, you know, I knew of her yeah. because she was yeah. in Toronto for a while, right? Yeah. Like, but, you know, I didn't hear about her until she came. She's, I think, England. maybe like one of the biggest, certainly female, but like one of the biggest UK stand ups right now. Yeah. I think one of the only, she's the only female comedian to have like a Netflix to have done a, a a Netflix special. She's got a second one coming out, and now she's making a sitcom for Netflix. Yeah, and she's and she she's fix. doing like um she's doing a panel show with Jimmy yeah. Carr, where yeah. she's sort of like the recurring like counterpoint. To yeah, that. It's yeah. Like, absolutely. And um, May Martin as well is another Canadian who came here, and it's just got um, is making a sitcom where like Lisa Kudrow is playing her mum, and like she's uh, May Martin's just she was doing the 
thought she was one of the comedians of the world, like another Canadian who I don't know her, but like that came to the UK and is now like, yeah, this is what this is what I do now. And I think she then like she has the best of both worlds because she can go back and like I think she writes for Baroness as well. So wow, has that, that those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Now, your material often has like very specific references, like the Duffer Mall. Um, <laughs> I used to literally when we started when we started dating, I was living like two streets down. So every time she'd come over to visit, we'd be like, I "Have to go to the mall." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean. Um, so, like, how do you handle that with those specific? local references or cultural references when carrying material to audiences who might not be familiar with them. That was interesting because the, um, so why, 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 why was just the, the different, people call it, in Toronto call it the different song, which I <laughs> love. Um, when we, we, that was in our first show uh, that we took to Edinburgh, we flipped it all to make it UK references. So I can't remember, I think it was like, we had uh, Little Chef, which is like Jeff a, from Little Chef. Chef. From Little Chef, which is Chef. It's a, like a cafe on a motorway service. It's yeah. traveling. You stop in a little chef and get a greasy breakfast. Jeff from Little Chef. A Greg. Just was yeah. the CN Tower. Oh yeah. It just any whatever it was. Whatever it didn't. Call, it was like yeah. it wasn't quite as funny. There's something about just saying Duff Room. Yeah. 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 I think because we funny. knew that you were really going there too, and it's yeah. just kind of like everybody <laughs> yeah. talks about it. It's kind of like, and everybody goes yeah. Duff Mall. You're like, oh, it's got the Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. We have so, lots of references. It's not glamorous, yeah. but it's good. No. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, I think from then, that was it was annoying that it doesn't. It, it was one of our favorite songs, and it was really annoying that it just didn't work with UK stuff. I think for the most part. We we found it with Australia actually. For the most part, everything travels quite well. But for us, the annoying thing is if it's a specific reference, it's usually a punchline or it's there for a reason. Yeah. yeah. And so then when you switch it out, it just takes the edge off of things. So we're it's a double edge, not double short, but it's we don't travel too much. But it when you do, it is annoying to then lose edges. So yeah. you sort of want to be able to write universally so that you never have to change anything. But then you do lose the specificity, which is why things are particularly funny. Yeah, yeah. We just did, in Melbourne, we had to change, we'd been touring the, touring our current show in the UK, and then took it, we took it to Toronto, actually, for the sketch fest. Yeah. And uh, I think there was, like, maybe eight, eight or nine references that we had to change for Toronto, that we knew as soon as we get to Melbourne, it's going to be the same ones that we have to yeah. work out a different. Some of them you just keep in because it, the rhyme is so good, yeah. and it's going to pass, the rhyme will feel fulfilling. Yeah. You might not find it funny, but it will be like, oh, Okay, they rhymed, which means it's the end of the first, yeah. which means we move on. But uh, in Melbourne, we had uh, uh, one of the punchlines is about a shop called Paper Chase in yeah. the UK, and they didn't have that in Melbourne. They had Office Works, but it would be uh, the time has come, we've earned our place to fuck shit up in Paper Chase. So we're like, we have to rewrite the two lines. We're, yeah. we're, their equivalent was Office Works. But that doesn't sound as good. No, yeah. it's something funny about Paper Chase as well. Yeah. So, the name is funny. I was just thinking all the way. I'm like, what a go. Sometimes you should spark yeah. something in somebody that they're like, what is that? And then it feels a little bit yeah. bad by something. Yeah. I still like that. You and you hear the word paper, so you're like, it's obviously a stationary <laughs> shot. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had to change it to, uh, the time has come, let's go berserk and fuck shit up in office work. And it's just not <laughs> as funny. It's all, it's all it fun. like work, it works. Yeah. Yeah. They hear office works and they're like, oh, they've adapted to the city. <laughs> yeah. Um, One of us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, I saw, I was at the Sketch Fest show. I was actually, you, you asked me which of you two I like better. Did I? And I totally froze up. <laughs> you did. Most nice people do freeze up. It's, we, we were just saying awful. the other day that it's such a horrible thing to ask the audience. <laughs> we tr- we try and not be too mean. We don't We don't go to the audience that much. Yeah. We try not to be mean. Because it's not fun to be mean to an like audience. We love you both the same. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of people say, I can't choose. Yeah. And it's not like we pay the joke back at any point. We just like to know. <laughs> yeah. In the first two minutes, who do you think? And we, we've, um, we changed it so we go to w- women often will say who they prefer more when you give it to a, when you ask a guy I think they're a bit like they think it's yeah, I don't want to choose trick. between two women they think <laughs> yeah. it's a trick um, Which we've fun. found out 80% of the time the woman, the woman will give you or you yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it's very unfair for me to ask you. Yeah, I was in the front row, so I was inviting you <laughs> that way. Um, but now, now, you have a song in your set about people who who are negative towards musical comedy. Um, do you find, like, with things like YouTube and like uh, Spotify, or these platforms where people seem to be getting more and more musical comedy out there, that attitudes towards musical comedy are changing? Do you feel people are becoming more receptive to it? Like, I think it definitely helps, things like YouTube and that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's still... I think people only have to see one bad musical comedian to write everyone off. Um, in the same way, I think it's better now, but like uh, not too long ago, people would see one bad, bad quotation marks female com- comedian and say, no female comedians are funny. Um, and I think it is still, we notice it like on mixed bills when we come out, that people do get nervous because it's, it can go, it can be bad. We can be bad as well. Like I, we're not the best people at it by any stretch. We can also not be great. And so I think it's, uh, it's still a thing that people are hesitant, hesitant towards, but if you can come out and smash it, or even in like the first 30 seconds, I think it relaxes people. Um, I don't think we're the people to open the world. <laughs> but even things like um, a Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and TV shows like that help yeah. so much because Rachel Bloom is so good. Oh, she that, Oh, gosh. Um, and, and the meticulous care she puts into every song. Yeah. And she's so open to people, too. Like, yeah. just on, on social media, she'll often just, like, start ra- answering questions randomly while yeah. sitting in the makeup chair. Yeah. Um, and she talks about pro- the process of yeah. her creative work and it's like wow yeah she's the per- oh, sorry. I was going to say that she's the perfect example of how you match genre with the, how you make the funniest song yeah. sound the funniest uh, like the music does half the work and then the lyrics do the other half yeah. I think there, there's lots of musical comedy that it's, it's in their particular style but the lyrics are the main thing and you're just playing four chords behind which is often very funny um, she married like she marries the like, music is so important to her show yeah. um, I think people that. often think as well that uh, musical comedians are musicians who are like I'm going to give comedy a go as yeah. opposed to comedians who are also play an instrument and think well I'll, I can put the two together well it's, it's like um Oh, uh, geez, Louise, I'm completely forgetting his name. Lair. Uh, oh, Tom Lair. Tom Lair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, you know, this is a I professor. I did that one the other day. Oh, it, you know, it's, and that again, like killing pigeons in the park. That's and my it's like, song. how dark? Yeah. yeah. How dark can you be? And this guy's not, he's not a, he's like not a professional comedian or a professional musician. Yeah. He's a professor of like math. Is he? Yeah. yeah. He's, he's, a, he's a genius. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and like road scholar level yeah. genius. Yeah. And he says like, ah, his friend friends on tinkling away singing his songs at a party and they're like you should do that and he did it and it's like and when he was done he's like I'm done I'm never talking to anybody about this again and and he's like withdrawn from that world but just pure genius and and everything he did there and at a time when like some of the themes like he did uh, uh, the Vatican the Vatican rag the Vatican rag genuflect 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 yeah it's like so good it's just masochism tango the masochism tango yeah yeah it's and that's that thing where it's like you know this is somebody's bringing the skill to bear this song is so I watched a um, really grainy black and white um, film version of him I think it was in it was in like Germany Germany or something like that and, the, and it's really old and the audience are very conservative and giggling like shoulders are going but no one's like letting loose yeah. and he's just at a piano uh, and he does this his songs are all like two and a half three minutes and so they're not huge songs yeah. and he'll sing the song about his opinion then he'll look round, back round to the audience and he'll say he'll do like half an hour of exposition then go back round <laughs> play song. and he's doing that I think it ran for like an hour and ten minutes or something like that and not one point he's doing the same thing each time talking piano talking piano and it never gets boring our biggest fear and our shows is talking, talking, talking in between, and um, just sat at a piano. Is this boring for an hour? Like, no matter how good your songs are, aesthetically, this isn't that 
pleasing to just two people at the piano. He's like, I did not get, I did not get distracted at one point. It shakes it up a bit, and you're like, what's he doing now? And it kind of perks it back in. Yeah, because his songs are so every song tied nightly, tied in a bow, and then moves are off. I think he's brilliant. His okay. rhymes are yeah. Well, like the, 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 I mean, you, th- you think taking the periodic table and setting yeah. it to music is yeah. going to be boring, but it's, like, yeah. it's, it's yeah. just genius. Yeah. 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 And you see like Daniel Radcliffe decades later yeah. performing yeah. it on yeah. late night television. I'm like, okay, yeah. I I didn't really like him in Harry. I mean, he's fine in Harry yeah. Potter. He's a kid. Yeah. I love him now. Yeah. <laughs> like like you know, singing this on late night television to an American audience yeah. who yeah. have no idea who this guy is yeah. who's before material is performing and it's just yeah. like okay I love you forever now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, last question uh, so I've done a lot of I've done some interviews with uh, like Courtney Gilmore who talked about their sort of craziest gigs uh, that they've done so what's the craziest gig that you guys have ever played oh crazy so, so it could be like location or circumstance okay. or... um Forget the first thing that popped to my head. It was the most different show we played. We did a in Toronto. We did a 420 show, the 420 festival, mm-hmm. and the room we started and the room was hotboxed by the end. And I remember coming off stage with the tries. We only 20 minutes. Yeah. And uh, it was still pretty new at that point, I think. So you're still just sort of playing. Your, I think we played Lady. We did play Lady. Like like There's a picture of us playing the recorders in front. The backdrop in the. Uh, the club is like a big marijuana leaf and there's, it's us as if a friend of mine was there took a picture of the two of us playing the recorder in front of this huge marijuana leaf and put it on Facebook and I think like my grade 7 recorder teacher commented like I'm still playing the recorder like, I was so high <laughs> <laughs> I remember coming on stage and being like, I don't know where I am. Yeah. <laughs> Two very white, conservative British females to yeah. hot box. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Um, we did a. I don't. It's not. It, this isn't good, crazy, but it's my favourite show in like a negative way that we've ever played. We did a corporate. Uh, we did a corporate. Oh, game. Okay. Yeah. This um, and we had lots of really nice corporates, and friends of ours were like, "Oh, corporates terrible." And like, oh, this will be. It'll be fine. We, they've always been great. Uh, and it was. Uh, I forget what the event was, but everyone was stood up. There was. No, it was in like a huge building. No. Uh, it was in like a bank, and the lights were up. Um, and we played a song uh, cooler than this, so with like a bunch of recorders. And they weren't. They didn't like Linda. They didn't like. They weren't really into it. They were just staring and just. They, did, they were there to socialise. They weren't there to see entertainment. Yeah. At all. It was not one part of their evening. Do they think? Yeah. To work and then to do my thing again. Yeah. Yeah. The ceilings were huge, which yeah. is fantastic for comedy. <laughs> uh, the space was massive. Yeah. Everyone was everywhere. Oh, there was no yeah. hub. And we played cooler than this. And one of the towards the end of it, before we uh, bring out the big recorder, we <laughs> Rosie shouts. When I say we are, you say cool. We are silence. We are silence. When I say we have, you say friends. We have silence. We have silence. Lots of silence. And I have to like turn around to pick up my recorder, and I could. I've never laughed so hard in my entire life, knowing that this is this is our life right now. Is screaming. We are cool to people who are like, you're not. I don't want to be here. I don't care what you're up. It to. was for a mental health charity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A little bit of edge on that as well. Yeah. yeah. It was the, the people who organised the, the evening were lovely. Yeah, they're and re- Like they really, they took care of you, but it just wasn't designed to yeah. do. Cool. They did. They could have taken our fee and put it towards the mental health. <laughs> it sounds like glad that you're glad you're a duel because what if you were just oh alone and that you didn't have each other? Every, and yeah. Maybe it wouldn't be as, as funny. Like, do you, ever have, do you ever think, like, thank God you're here? Yeah. Every, yeah, yeah. God damn it's it. after a work in progress. It uh, shows me you're trying out new material, especially if you've travelled outside of London, so you've got to get a train home by yourself. Yeah. If you've done a really bad new material gig, you see up each other to make each other laugh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or be like, yeah, that was shit, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. And you can enjoy the shit together. Yeah, and otherwise, it's just you just going crazy being like I can't do this yeah. I, I, I have so much respect for stand-ups and who, uh, who travel touring as well it's such a lonely can be quite a lonely thing and also but on the flip side of that it's nice with two of you when things are cool when you do get to do something where you're like this is amazing this is so 
look, it's nice to have another person to check in and be like, what's happening right now? I don't know, it's cool though, isn't it? And like, without, you can do that with friends, but at some point it becomes a brag. Yeah. Um, and so you can take, or you feel like you can't share it because it feels like you're bragging and you don't want to be telling other people these cool things. So it's nice to have another person to be like, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah we've got Chris in the green room. Yeah, we've got Chris in the green room. That's pretty sick. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you Moving think, up. Do you yeah. think like, as sisters, it's a different dynamic as, as a duo than, like, how is that helpful? To, to, to it makes it a shortcut because it means yeah. that we, when you don't like something, there's no. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say there's also, this sounds negative, where it does it's negative, but like, there's no. Um, there's, that, there's nothing to lose. Like, we're always going, this sounds cheesy, but we're always going to be sisters. There's no relationship to be lost by saying that rhyme is terrible. How dare you bring this to me? <laughs> um, which is not, and it, it means that I think, I can't, I've never been in like a duo with another person, but like, it does feel like we get to move very quickly because there's a lack of preciousness and you don't have to sort of walk around things too much, I think. You can just be like, that shit, let's not do it. But you, like, you can say to each other, I didn't like, I don't like that. That's yeah. not fun. without being offense, offended because yeah. you can also predict what the other person's brain is. We yeah. have the same brain, we exactly. have the same DNA. But you didn't we, have to get to know each other. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And we were raised on the same, we both watched The Simpsons, we both watched The Green yeah. Teenage Witch, we both watched The Amanda Show. Our reference levels are the same. And yeah. like, we still have differences. We watch different comedy and we enjoy different things. So we're not, we're not one person, we're not twins. Yeah. Also, twins are not one person. Yeah. <laughs> There's like at least a little bit of separation there. Yeah. And we're still draw from different and with very different people yeah but when it comes to what we enjoy making and singing about and doing I think it's quite we're on the same page yeah but with, I think if we wrote our own shows we wrote solo shows which they'd be so different so the, the fun of this and the, the very difficult part of this is having to find the group the the shared group. like there are so many diagram, songs we can't yeah, yeah. Slip we're finding that little bit in the middle uh, which does prove quite it does prove quite hard because um, there's only like out of the 100% of ideas you have only 10% of them really work between the two of us because uh, you have to find out to make your brain sit on that same level um, there's so many songs we want to do separately like the, if we were written our own that we'd have gone in different directions it's just nice to just find that yeah. where do I oh, oh this is where our brains sit together and then you and then you find that specific weird thing alright well um, if people wanted to find your material online uh, where would be best for them to, to reach out to or check it out pornhub.com <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other sister app that's not my game um we're on all social media at Flo and Joan. Um, we have a website, flowandjoan.com, but it is... Right now it's a mess. People keep emailing us telling us that your, our website doesn't work and we know we're going to fix it. Um, so don't go there right now. Um, and then we also have two albums out, uh, The Kindness of Stranglers and Victory Flaps, which are on uh, iTunes and Spotify and all music places. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You know how to book flights and hotels. All you're missing is a tool to plan the travel experiences you'll have once you arrive. That's why you need Viator. Book guided tours, activities, excursions, and more in one place to make your trip truly unforgettable. Viator has over 300,000 travel experiences to choose from. Everything from simple tours to extreme adventures and all the niche, interesting stuff in between. So you can plan something that everyone you're traveling with will enjoy. Real traveler reviews give the inside scoop from people who've already been on the experiences you're considering. So you can plan with confidence. Free cancellation helps you plan for the unexpected. And 24-7 customer support means you can travel worry-free. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. Find travel experiences for you. Do more with Viator. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Coriant. 
Corient provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding your expectations and simplifying your life. Corient has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Corient has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Corient has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of planning, investing, lending, and money management disciplines. Leverage Corient's exclusive network of experts to craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex they may be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, connect with a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. That's C-O-R-I-E-N-T.com. Corient.com.